The story of Upbuild began in a monastery. On our quest to understand ourselves more deeply, we recognize that it is our attachment to our egos, our identities, that gets in the way of being our true selves. This podcast will help you understand your ego. It will help you better understand your inner world, the motivations, insecurities, and emotions that affect your every action and relationship. Welcome to Upbuilding the Self. Hi, everyone. This is Vipin Goyal, one of the partners at Upbuild, and I'm here with Rasanath today. Rasanath, how are you doing? I'm doing all right. So I have been <laughs> waiting to have this conversation with you for years, I would say, <laughs> for years and years. Let me introduce the frame of that in a second, but maybe I'll start by just saying how we first met each other, because I think that's the kind of inspiration for this conversation to begin with. And I met you when I was in the process of doing a bunch of idea generation for my previous company with my co-founder. And we came to this TEDx event in New York to <laughs> gather inspiration for our work. <laughs> and you were one of the 16 speakers at that event. And I remember very distinctly, we were there the entire day listening to all 16 speakers and you, your talk really stood out to me. And I went to look for you after at the <laughs> backstage, but you had already left the premises. And so with a little magic on Google, I was <laughs> able to trace you back to the monastery where you were living and then came to find you a few days later. And that was the beginning of what's turned into a beautiful friendship. And that was 10 years, more than 10 years ago now. Yeah. It's funny when you, when you lay it out that way, because I feel like I've known you forever. Amazing. Thank you. <laughs> it's amazing to think that that was a beginning. And now we've been working together so intimately for more than five years. It's quite incredible how these things happen. Not planned. <laughs> Not planned. So. The frame for this conversation is that when I first met you, I remember specifically going into the monastery and having that first conversation and thinking that people who become monks, they must be innately predisposed to religion and spirituality in the same way that I felt predisposed to whatever path I was on, whatever would make other people think highly of me. <laughs> and uh, as I got to know you, I realized how untrue that assumption was. I realized how extremely difficult a decision it was for you to become a monk, to move into the monastery, to leave all the trappings of the life that comes from having been at IIT and moved to the US and become an investment banker. I also realized that it was potentially no easier than the same decision would have been for me. And that really blew my mind because all of a sudden I could understand what it must have been like for you to do what you did. And so this is the story that I've been waiting to ask you about for all of these years. And I'm excited to share with our community. Thank you. It's also a time of my life that's very close to my heart. And I haven't necessarily explicitly spoken about that particular juncture. I've spoken about it in bits and pieces here and there, sharing things. And I think you have been privy to most of them, but I haven't necessarily spoken about it in one sh long shot. So I am myself very curious about how all the things that will come back to me <laughs> from that time. <laughs> so I'm as much I'm as much a, a part of the audience as I'm sharing my story. Okay. <laughs> Good. I love that. That's yes, your speaker and a witness. <laughs> it's uh, it's pretty amazing to be in that in that space and I feel like that juncture of my life was very much being the actor on stage as well as the witness 
from the audience perspective as to what was happening, what was unfolding. And there is no other way I can explain this other than being able to experience both simultaneously is quite magical and mystical is the best way I can put it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so let, let's get into it. I have so many questions to ask you about your life's journey, but that could become a five part, 10 hour <laughs> podcast. And I think the question, the specific point at which I'm excited to really unpack is this decision to go into the monastery. But let's just start with a little bit of back context for both of us and for everybody. So I'd love to start with just a little arc of who you were as a kid and what motivated you, because that's the starting point to get to where you ended up. (laughs) Thank you. As a kid, I was very drawn towards intellectual achievements. That's the best way I can describe it. And I'm also understanding and processing so much of my own childhood now than I've Mm -hmm. ever done before. But what really motivated me was success and primarily intellectual success. And I looked at school that way and I participated in all activities that gave me intellectual accolades. Sports was not the thing, although I did participate in sports and wanted to win in them because that gave me a sense of belonging. <laughs> but that was not that was not what I considered to be my sense of identity from a point of view of achievement and success. And that trajectory, that desire only grew with time. And I think it was when I was in eighth grade when India opened up its economy and a lot of foreign channels, American channels came into India. I saw the movie Wall Street and it created an immediate impression in my my mind about what the notion, the actual notion of success can look like. Now, the intellectual bent of mind felt very strongly that if I were to get to the place, work on Wall Street, that would also give me a sense of, it was not just about the money, the riches, power. It was about proving that I had the wits (laughs) to belong there and to be the smartest in that space. And that's what pushed me in that direction. And IIT, going to IIT, as much as I grew up in a family of engineers, going to IIT was actually a doorway to getting to getting closer to Wall Street. So okay. that's the trajectory in general. Yeah. So so ju- just to clarify for everyone's benefit, you were born in Bombay. That was and born in Bombay. this whole your first 20 years were there. Yes, my first 20 years was in was in Bombay, Mumbai. Mumbai At that time it was called yeah. Bombay and then yeah. the name changed to Mumbai. And that's where I yeah, I spent the first 20 21 years of my life and then yeah. after graduating from college from IIT at that time, McKinsey and, and Deloitte and Intel went to the IITs to recruit for offices in the US. Yeah. And this was just the dot com boom period, just to give a sense of timeline. So, you know, around 99, 2000. And so I had my job offer to work for Deloitte. And that's how I came to New York. Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> so you were in, in, in Mumbai. You had always been oriented to what you said, intellectual success or academic success. That's the area where you really pushed hard. And you watched the movie Wall Street. That that helped define as a very interesting anchor for your definition of what success could really look like. And that left a deep impression on you. And you go to IIT, which is the Indian Institute of Technology, which is described in many different ways, whether it's the Caltech or MIT of India, but also like an acceptance rate of less than 1% or something. Yeah, yeah, that that time was 1.2%. 1.2%. And then there's now, what, 10 or more IITs, but IIT Mumbai, it was, you know, at the top of that stack. So it You've emerged, you've gone to college at the most elite institution in the entire country. And liberalization had happened 10 years prior. There's opportunity to go abroad, to make yourself a real success. And you've jumped on that path. Yes, absolutely. I mean, there was, I 
it, it almost felt like this is what I was born to do <laughs> you know, yeah. in a sense, right? It's, this is exactly the wave that I need to ride. And it almost felt very natural to me in that sense of the term. Now, here's where I think the first, if you were to call existential angst appeared, hmm. is uh, when I went to IIT, suddenly you find yourself amongst the intellectual geniuses. <laughs> and you realize that you're not the best. <laughs> and that's a disappointment. <laughs> And now I can laugh about it, but at that time it was very painful because up until that point in time, I had always felt, I was very bad at test taking, but I was very smart in a room that I could, I could really do well in conversations. I could figure and solve problems. But when I went to IIT, it was uh, I just the, kind of peop- the kinds of people that I was surrounded by just gave me a deep sense of inferiority complex. <laughs> You must have had a lot higher expectations for yourself than I did because when I went to college, I just assumed I was going to be average there. So that it was not it was not a shock to my system. It, it set my expectations there. I just uh, there, there is there is you always compare yourself with the, with people around you, yeah. and suddenly the set of people around you has been just it's the it's the cream of the crop. And I, I, I was definitely not as smart. It was a hard realization to come to. I was definitely not as smart. And that made me nervous, which then it affects your own capacity and confidence too. My confidence was very severely dented at that time. And that really also gave me a sense of, I guess I would say the quest for more inner discovery. Who am I and what am I doing here actually started there with that existential crisis of sorts. Yeah, that was my next question. How did spirituality enter the frame? Because it it had to be a seed that was planted long before you actually walked through into the monastery doors. I, alongside all of these ambitions and I would say dreams that I was pursuing, I don't remember a time when I, I did not have a sense of existential angst about the world. Uh, and that was primarily related to death and dying and knowing that at some point in time i would lose all my loved ones i was and am very attached to my family my parents and i have a very close relationship i'm very close to my sister as well and deep down i always felt that i would lose them at some point and i also knew that any sort of material success And nobody had explained this to me. This was just observing the world around me. That loss was very evident. And somehow I did not want to lose. (laughs) You're saying the loss, even, you know, after material success, loss of that material success. Loss of that material success. uh, The temporality of it all. You could have reached the pinnacle and still lose. I saw it with sports teams. I was a big, I was a, I was a big sports fan. I was a big fan of watching playing cricket uh, growing up, and this is what we do in India. It just became clear that even after winning uh, the world title, you used to lose after that. And uh, the, the winning captain had so much anxiety to face after the victory because you have to keep it up. And somehow, even as a youngster, I just felt that wow, this is. This is just a, a never-ending cycle here, and it's it's incredibly stressful. I didn't have the vocabulary to explain this at that time, mm-hmm. but I felt it in my body, and I, I had a sense of anxiety about it. About not being able to maintain, even if you achieved something, not being able to maintain it. Yes, and it's somehow, it, it sort of felt meaningless, <laughs> because you pursue something that you will lose either with time and even in the process of getting it and then in the process of preserving it, there's just so much stress. Mm. What's the point? <laughs> well, you know, the thought that's coming to my mind is if you were able to maintain it, would it all of a sudden have meaning? Or <sighs> is it the temporality of it that gave you that feeling that what's the point? It was the temporality. And uh, what's, what I also noticed is that maintaining it required 
it was very stressful maintaining it. And a big part of maintaining it was to constantly grapple with the fear of losing it. <laughs> People invest so much in maintaining what they have, actually. That's a, that, that's a, a big part of our current setup in the world is yeah. oriented around main, maintenance. It's true. And you also see this uh, in the clients that we serve, you know, an entrepreneurial idea when you're ideating, there is nothing to lose. So, you know, you can go full on towards it. But as soon as you start to become a success, you get a little bit of a success. Suddenly the orientation is around, well, how do I preserve it and maintain it? And now the freedom that I had when I started (laughs) thinking about an idea, truly ideating, gets severely constrained because I now become attached to the notion of success more than discovery or the joy of living an experiment. Right. So so you have this inkling and yet you still then decided, I'm going to go to New York City and become an investment banker. And uh, to me, that's the, I think the irony or the tragic element of that is there was no place to really process all of this as a youngster. Mm -hmm. And first of all, you don't have the vocabulary to explain it. But even if uh, I, I, this is at least how I felt, even if I did to the people around me, I got responses like, you know, well, don't worry about it, you know, Uh, or, well, that's something that, you know, is just a part of this world and we all have to deal with it. And the answers seemed resigned is the best way I can put it. And, And so that resignation also rubbed off on me. And at the same time, I... The inertia of material success was definitely not lost. As I mentioned earlier, I felt very naturally suited for the wave that was going through India at that time with economic liberalization and everything else. And so there was clearly a schism within me where the dawning of the temporality of the material realm and the attraction of the of the material living simultaneously. And I would say the material did win up until a certain point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Not ultimately, but uh, <laughs> maybe maybe as an interim. <laughs> yeah. And even now I see how easy it is to slip back. And when I say, when I use the word slip back, it still lives in me. The not fully lost the excitement of the shine of success. Yeah. But it's um I the best way I can say is I I now know too much about it and also have the vocabulary to articulate it for myself and to other people. Yeah. And can you say when you say you now know too much about it, about yeah. material success, what do you now know that you didn't know before? I can, it's an example when I was working in um, in investment banking and I decided to quit my job to join the monastery. I'm fast forwarding here a little bit. Yeah, great. This example will be very helpful. I was having this conversation with uh, one of my managing directors who I've worked with quite a bit in the telecom space. And he and I had an amazing working relationship. And he had a newborn at that time. And he was very appreciative of the fact that I had made this decision for my life. And he said that I wish I could do the same, but he said, I'm a prisoner of my own success. And he was from Colombia and he quoted something in in Spanish that he translated for me in English. He said, you know, I'm a prisoner of, it's better to be a famous bad guy than a not so famous good guy. (laughs) And to me, that summarized the prison of success. That doesn't mean material success is. And when I share this, it it can so easily feel like, oh, material success must be bad. And that's not what uh, I I know for a fact, having been attracted to it very strongly and, and spent a lot of time in it, thinking about it. Material success is not bad. Our attachment to it is what creates the prison. So that is something that I know too much about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and the prison of it, with your, your colleague, this managing director, sounds like he's explicitly describing the prison of the ego and wanting to 
it better to be a famous bad guy than a not so famous good guy. It's the ego's need for recognition, validation. validation. Yeah. yeah. And uh, <laughs> I was working with someone last week and uh, that person said something to the same effect. She was like, well, I want to move away from all of this, but I need two more, just two more wins and then I'll be fine. <laughs> And I just laugh, laugh, and we both laughed because she's had a lot of success in her in her life, and she knew too well what she was saying too. But like famous last words, right? <laughs> it never ends. It only the dose the dosage is only upped with yeah. time when we are attached. That's how we become prisoners. It's the yeah. you you become you become you sort of become an addict. So funny because that story reminds me that when I was deciding to join you guys at Upbuild, one of the internal dialogues I was having is I've been a first time entrepreneur and I've learned a lot through this process. We ended up selling our company and I'm really poised to do this a second time and do it much better the second time. And so I was like, I should just do one more, one more round, and then I will come to do the work I really want to do with Upbuild. And as I thought more and more about that, it was the same thing that you're saying. I could imagine that being an endless cycle. And if I knew what I really wanted to do, what was stopping me from doing it now? That's right. Yeah, And um, it, this just reminds me of another conversation that I had with a client last week. Somehow you see the convergence of this topic happen with the in people that we work with. And he was he was mentioning how, again, has had a lot of success. And, you know, he's in his 60s and he wanted to do it again. And so he quit his job and he's starting off again in, in a new place. And there is a feeling that maybe the first time it was not because of me, it was it was luck. <laughs> but the second time around, it's going to be purely me. <laughs> right. And as we explored it, you see how much the ego wants to eliminate any idea of external help or luck or good fortune and be solely established in the fact that everything has been done solely. I'm the cause. I did it. I, I did prove, it. Prove myself. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Okay, so you helped us fast forward a little bit. Let me just walk to this point of this decision that you had to make. You finished IIT, you came to the US, you were working for Deloitte, you went back to get your MBA at Cornell. I mean, you're living the you're living the dream, you know, born in a middle-class Indian family, sent their ch- son to IIT went to the United States, working in New York as a consultant, went to Ivy League business school, and then you went to an investment bank and you're working in the investment bank for a couple of years while you also have your spiritual life happening in parallel. And then you need to make this decision. So maybe maybe you can just share a bit about how are these two things happening in parallel tracks? You're at an investment bank and what's happening in your spiritual life at this point? Thank you. Uh, going back to when I was at IIT and the the the, in the sense of inferiority complex given the people that I was surrounded by was extremely painful. I, I remember very clearly being depressed about that and my notion of being the smartest in the room being shattered. I had to really acknowledge and accept that I'm not. Mm. And I decided to compensate for it by hard work. And I knew that if I worked really hard, I could more than make up for it. And to some extent, it was true. I did. But it left a very deep scar impression on me around the pain of an identity shattering. And that was the start of my spiritual journey where I recognized connecting the temporality of life that I had always experienced, that all of this that I was working towards is temporary, will be taken away from me, ultimately by death. And I had to really find what is the meaning of all of this. (laughs) And I did a lot of searching in spiritual paths, religious paths. That's when I met my teacher, not by design, 
there was almost a, an inkling that I shouldn't walk into the room and I saw a poster for the program that uh, I was invited for, but I still went and it was a big turning point in my own life and my spiritual journey. And yet the ambition for success still had so much inertia that it pulled me to the US and I went to business school until right before I joined investment banking, I had a near-death experience. This is where I, I say that somehow the feeling that the universe was conspiring <laughs> to remind me of what had the risk of being forgotten, that whole notion around temporality, death and dying, and the stress and the crisis that comes from it. And I experienced it firsthand. <laughs> And it, uh, it gave a second wind, I would say, to the spiritual calling. And at this time, more vigorously, I remember after that experience, sitting on the lawn of the university campus, and you know, Cornell has this beautiful undulation of like green, and you can just stare into you know, the, the Cayuga Valley and the Finger Lakes, and just staring into space and really like, really thinking, wow, I have to discover this. I can't really let my life slip past me and at the end not know who I am and why I'm here. And to me, I feel like that opportunity is available for, I think everybody goes through that at some point in time in their life. Sometimes it's for a few moments. Sometimes it's for extended periods of time. And it shows up in various ways as, as depression sometimes, as anxiety, stress, conflict. But there is this question, well, where am I going? What's, where, all, where is all of this going? And because there are so many things to keep us sufficiently distracted, we don't uh, get the opportunity to fully investigate. And that was the moment when I felt like I can't let this, it would be, I would regret if I did not take the chance that I have been given through that near-death experience and also the fact that I lived was for me a gift to explore what the true meaning of my life is and who am I really. Thank you for sharing that. So you, this existential question had been there for a long time, back from when you were in college, about who am I, what is my purpose, what is the meaning of my life? not exactly dormant, but it, it's been there as a thread. And then you had a near-death experience and it reminded you, hey, these questions are really important. And I can't just let them go. And I've had a second chance almost to make sure that I discover. So you're sitting on Cornell's campus, looking at the undulating hills. And then what happens? <laughs> it's uh, uh, very distinctly, this was two days before my first accounting. Again, this is the throwback in time. <laughs> I feel like I'm witnessing myself back in time again. And I remember really tearing up, just sitting alone, just really, really tearing up. It was just this aftermath of this near-death experience and what it had just opened up for me. And then also, I guess, helplessly recognizing that the inertia of success was, uh, the current of it was just so strong that I, despite the waking up call, right, of a near-death experience, I couldn't just abandon that. <laughs> I couldn't abandon that pursuit. And I, I recognized the helplessness in being carried by that current of ambition that uh, I also, uh, it, was, it was very clear to me that if I artificially interrupted it, then it would come back with a vengeance. <laughs> mm. And at the same time, I couldn't make that the sole aim of my life. I had to give the spiritual calling a true chance, which is when it was absolutely clear to me that I had to invest in this other side, the spiritual calling. And the easiest way for me to do that was to be a part of this monastery in New York that I was associated with in my study of spirituality and the Gita that started back in IIT. And so I decided, I make the decision to live in the monastery as I worked on Wall Street. 
That's pretty dramatic. <laughs> it is. It didn't feel like that at that time. It felt this is the only thing I needed to, I, I had to do this. And that's why when I say the story, as it was happening and as it was unfolding, it was not something that I ever thought of. It was not, that, there was no notion in my mind that I would be sharing this story at any point. In time. <laughs> right. I just remember you sharing with me what that looked like, practically speaking. And you're in a monastery with all of your monastic brethren on the floors, sleeping side by side in one big room, and then waking up at 4 a.m. for your morning chanting and prayers with everybody (laughs) and going to work, putting on your suit while everybody (laughs) else is wearing their robes, going into your investment bank working till midnight, coming back, putting your suit into the one shared closet and finding your spot among all of the other monks who are already asleep for hours before that, getting a few hours before then you went through the process again. And quite an intense experience, even though, like you said, for you, that seemed to be normal for your life. It almost seemed like I was just being pulled in a certain direction. Mm -hmm. I had no, in once, yes, I did have a choice, but I felt like I didn't, this is just something that I had to do. And that's what a calling feels like. To me, that's the best way to describe it. It's almost like, uh, like it's calling. Like I have to respond to it. There is just no other way of living. It's not to say that there are no doubts. There's so many doubts. And what signifies that it's a calling is despite the doubts, you just feel like I have to do this. There's just no other way. And so, that's that's what it was. Uh, and I think the intensity of that life was fueled by the calling of discovery. It was not, uh, if you ask me if I would do that again, <laughs> I probably would say, no, I can't physically uh, or even emotionally go through that phase Again, it was very intense. But at that time, it just felt very natural. This is this is what I have to do. It's so funny when you just talked about a calling. I had this image of, you know, back in the analog days where you'd have regular <laughs> wired in phones and a phone ringing. And it's just there's a call coming and it, you couldn't just push a button and disconnect it. So <laughs> if that ringing is continuous and it's there and it just doesn't stop at some point you you, you have, have no choice but to pick up the phone and so right. when so true. I, that was the image that was coming to me as you're talking image. about a calling and it's if it keeps ringing like you said it's a calling and it's begging for you to pick it up yeah and, and pay attention pay attention mm-hmm. to it again my experience in the work that we do now and even in the past is that Everybody has that deep inner calling. At some point in time, the questions arise and we get distracted. Other things just pull of us away from the calling. And yeah, we find ourselves also telling stories about how, well, I just can't do that. Or well, that's just an escapism from the real thing that I really need to go after. Yeah, I personally feel like... It's such an opportunity. So you actually answered that call. I mean, you were living in the monastery and working at an investment bank, and you had all your ambitions of who you wanted to become. And then you made a decision to leave everything and become a full-time monk. And so you answered that call. And I want to know everything about that decision. Take us right there. What were you afraid of? What doubts did you have? What would you be losing by stepping into the monastery? Take us there. It is wrenching. And you live, for me, from the time that I had this uh, near-death experience and made this decision to pursue that inner calling more strongly to the time that I made uh, the decision to join the monastery full-time was a period of four years. <laughs> and it was a wrenching four years. So the things that I was attached to very deeply was my notion of success. 
and it's so deeply embedded. Uh, and having like gotten there, gotten to being an investment banker, and then the possibilities that emerged from that mm-hmm. <laughs> in terms of career and where it can go, that was a big attachment. Then also how people looked at me, right? Which is smart. When you told, when you told yeah, when I you told them what you banker. did. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, like saying it, you know, how saying it casually and then <laughs> looking for the glint in their eye. <laughs> <laughs> and that becoming my sense of identity and sort of reveling in it. That was a very big attachment. Then the other things, simple and yet not so simple things, right? Like insurance and health care and what would, <laughs> if I joined the monastery, then what would happen to you if I, if I fell sick? Mm-hmm. Who would take care of you? And the biggest of all, I would say, was turning away from my family. That was just the hardest I knew I would break my parents' heart in a big way. And given that, I was very close to them. And not that they they expected me to be, they wanted me to be successful enough to be able to be happy in life. Yeah. Maintain a, maintain a good life, have a good family. But the disappointment that they would experience from me having made this decision to walk away from everything. And also monastic life required for me to, I would say not sever my ties, but lower the attachment to family and sort of relinquish that sense of identity that comes from being, you know, a part of that family. It was very, very hard. I had, I used to have frequent dreams of my mother dying as I told her that this is what I wanted to do. And I remember waking up in a cold sweat. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and these were not easy decisions. I experienced a lot of guilt and shame around what my sense of identity would be if I walked away from what I had. Now, the other challenge alongside that was living in the monastery. A lot of the monks actually knew my attachments. And and I was also seen as a person inside where inside the monastery where like, yeah, you know, he is just attached to wealth and money. And and there there was also the sort of like, well, I want to prove them wrong. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> and again, that's not the right reason to join a monastery. But again, the, you see how this sense of ambition and wanting to be the best starts to show up when others don't see you in a certain light. And to also recognize then that this is not the right reason to do what I need to do. <laughs> so there was that conflict as well, playing itself out. And then there was enough justification to like, well, I could use the money and the wealth and everything that came with it to like charity, support, spiritual causes and mm-hmm. and all of that too. And there was enough to justify all of that as well. But what I had to really ask myself is, is that a justification or is that what I really believed in? And, and that takes leaning into the tension and learning how not to, to artificially resolve it or to flip over to one side. Because that tension creates a lot of stress and anxiety, but especially in this situation, that what what it really what I really learned during that time was to learn how to live in it, and ask for help through prayer, through counsel. It's very humbling <laughs> when you have to do that time and time again in order to resolve this tension in a natural, integrated fashion. And I am so grateful for the individuals who did not give up on me during that time, who stayed with me, who walked with me on that path, Hari Prasad being one of them, and who encouraged me and challenged me in exactly the right quantity. Uh, I don't know, without that, it would have been impossible. So the way I came to make that decision was to resolve my own sense of internal shame and guilt that I so intensely felt around my sense of identity, my success, my attachment to my family, and uh, recognizing that I will have to still carry those after I made the decision. The guilt doesn't go away. The shame doesn't go away. It's knowing willingly that that's the price for recognizing and realizing who I am. Then the connection with those emotions changed to the fact that this was the price that I have to pay for the deeper discovery. Then I was able to carry them more gracefully. And then the decisions became, it was almost like, yes, I have to do this. I have to move into the monastery. 
as I was listening to you, I was thinking about all of these challenges that were there. You're talking about the attachments, the shame, and trying to mitigate those. And what I was wondering is, what was the force that was pulling you forward? So there's these pieces that you have to make sure are managed and mitigated, but then there's a much (laughs) stronger, like, as you mentioned, the calling and pull that says, despite all of these things, it's going to be worth it to make this decision, even when there's a lot of costs and potentially a lot of loss associated with it. And the clarity about the benefit. How (laughs) did you know that this was going to help you find who you are, what is your purpose, and and what is the meaning of it all? Thank you. So there were a bunch of things that happened. Again, the synchronicity and the, uh, the convergence of what the universe does when your desire is sincere is, again, what I was able to witness as I was going through the experience myself. And a bunch of things happened. Um, One is the hype of Wall Street and looking at it from the inside. It was almost like somebody had pulled the veil off and I could see the the mess (laughs) from from within. It's like Um, the Wizard of Oz. You actually see the person behind uh, behind the wizard who's operating. And it's shocking to really witness the experience of suffering that from the outside appears a success. Mm. I saw with people who had enormous success over the years, broken relationships, emptiness, loneliness. And I don't know why, but somehow I had developed enough relationships with people in the in my work front where when we were having dinners at nights in conference rooms, people would just like share what's happening. And you then see the emptiness and I was able to experience it both for myself from the inside, but also experience it through other people's lives. Yeah. That was one factor that pushed, you know, further in that direction. And then the turmoil on Wall Street in 2008, which was, I mean, it couldn't have been timed better for me personally in my journey. Yeah. Hence the synchronicity as you're yeah, saying. Yeah, the, the synchronicity of it. And I witnessed six rounds of layoffs from the inside. I was still uh, somehow spared and I was working. <laughs> but the kind of anxiety and stress that was uh, unprecedented, I would say, at that time. So that was, again, like another factor. And the pulling factor on the other side was really witnessing and being able to spend time with my spiritual teacher. And uh, the, I began to taste the freedom that he was experiencing. And, you know, through osmosis, through spending time. And that's why I say I owe a lot to people who walked with me on my journey. And he was by far the most significant person, Radhanath Swami, who, you know, I owe a lot to. And just being able to spend that time with him and experiencing how free he was as a person with no attachments, <laughs> free from the ego. And then being able to taste that and taste that over time, something within me was like, that is what I want. And I so badly want it. <laughs> and that's what we call Sangha, the association of the right people and what it can do for us in that spiritual, in, when we are in that place of spiritual calling is that pull comes from someone who has walked that path before you and you see what can be the possibility and tangibly begin to experience it and taste it vicariously though, but still be able to taste it. To me, that was by far what, what really pulled me in the direction of going really deep into this exploration. Yeah. It sounds like that happened I mean, you had a relationship with Radhanath Swami that had spanned years, maybe almost a decade at that Mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. So you decided to join the monastery. And then did you know right away that it was the right decision? And (laughs) did it always feel that way? Or were there points in time where you had doubts? You questioned, did I do the right thing? (laughs) <laughs> when did it's you a, know for sure? It's uh, I, I remember where it was, uh, where it happened. I had actually spent a weekend with Radhanath Swami 
in 2009. So it happened in a bunch of ways. Hari Prasad, who was my very close friend, also was living in the monastery, working outside just like I was. And mm. we had shared so many experiences together. And he had made his decision to join full time. It was very clear for him, you know, that he needed to join. And him joining was such a such an exciting thing for me because I knew I had company on the other side. The 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 brotherhood and the friendship that was just around the spiritual calling was just such an attractive pull. Again, the pieces and the way they were moved was just so undeniably like pulling me in that direction. The, and the second thing was I had spent a weekend with Ramnath Swami and, and I had witnessed the magic of transformation, like in a bunch of programs that he had done. It was just incredible what had that weekend. I would never forget that. It was just the possibility of really being able to serve his mission around uplifting consciousness. And what I saw happen that weekend was just, uh, it created a very, very strong impression. And I remember sitting and reliving that weekend and feeling like, well, why am I shackled to working a full-time job that I can experience that at every moment? <laughs> and it just became this just overwhelming feeling of like, I have to do this. There is yeah. just no, there is, there is no recourse. And at that time, I felt no, I felt that I would regret if I did not. And while there were hardships that I could foresee, even now I can say very clearly, I don't regret one bit of the decision that I made. And there were many hardships. When I joined the monastery full-time, we experienced a lot of uh, very complex <laughs> situations. The monastery is also not an easy place to live and, and grow in. But I, looking back, I wouldn't change anything. Yeah, it's so funny. It really parallels my decision to join Upbuild. I felt very similar that I just, I don't know exactly what, this is going to look like, but I have to do this. <laughs> and I think that that is not atypical of what it feels like to find that type of calling purpose. I feel so happy that you share it that way because uh, I, I saw you going through that. It felt very familiar to me. <laughs> it felt very familiar and it was also exciting because it felt like I knew what was happening and it's such a gift to go through that experience because you realize also that there are other players behind the scenes who are who are working on your life you're being sculpted right and that experience of feeling like I am being sculpted by forces that are completely beyond my control and imagination is the miracle and the magic and the mysticism behind following that calling. I want every person to experience that. <laughs> um, you know, why shot change our life? It's pretty incredible. It is. It is. So, man, I could keep talking with you about this for hours. Actually, I have 100 more questions that I want to ask you. And I know that we are nearing the end of our time. So the last thing I would love to hear from you on this topic is you just said, I would love for everybody to experience this. And that you said earlier in our time together that people, almost everybody experiences this existential calling at some point in their lives, what advice do you have for people to hear that call? Because it can seem for a lot of folks that there's nothing ringing. Like where, how do I start the process of finding purpose, finding a calling? Can I do anything or is it just up to the universe to hit me over the head with it? And I'm just praying that that happens. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we all have a sense of existential angst. It's a universal experience. Some of us are facing it at present through circumstances. We can also see what's happening in the world around us. And for some of us, even as we are having success and doing exceedingly well in our lives, everything is going really well. 
paying a little attention to, well, what am I, what am I afraid of? And really exploring that door to go into understanding the ego and its hold <laughs> on our lives, to me, is the starting point in this journey. We all have been given this, I would say, gift. <laughs> sometimes the calling is loud. Sometimes the calling has been muted. But I would never say that the calling is never not loud. Or that never non-existent. Just, or never non-existent. We just choose to put that on mute, just like how we can turn our phones, our ringer off. <laughs> we just turn it off. And sometimes we still see, you know, how on your iPhone, the call still appears on the screen. And we just like, look, <laughs> and we say, ah, you know, I would say, well, pick it up and follow the thread. If you have the right people in your lives to talk about that and process it, that would be even even bigger, but it doesn't have to be. It was quite dramatic for me, but it, uh, it, it doesn't have to necessarily be that dramatic, although it can still be the same experience of exploration and, and depth. If we choose to just spend a little time pursuing that calling and what it is really trying to say mm -hmm. and understanding our own egos and the hold it has in our lives is the best place I would suggest that we start. And it's showing up. Our egos are showing up uh, in our relationships and our decisions every single day. And we face insecurities because of that. So just starting to explore our insecurities around our ego <laughs> is the place to explore the calling. <laughs> yeah, thank you. What I'm getting from you is that first, there has to be a desire to find that calling, find that That's purpose. Right. And then recognizing that often when we're li listening for that calling, we have to recognize, be aware of where the voice of the ego that can also <laughs> be present that we are hearing as a calling. So we have to be aware of that, of our egos and of, our, of the voice of the ego to then be able to tune into something that seems more like or sounds more like an inner guide. That's where that calling and that purpose comes from. It's true. Uh, so calling functions in two ways. It starts mostly with a feeling like I don't have something. And that's calling too, because it is showing the void <laughs> that I am choosing to fill with something else or choosing to ignore. And that is a calling. That is really helpful. Yeah. And many times we don't choose, we choose to just glaze over it or continue to fill it with something else. The second part of that calling is when we choose to go down, what am I missing? Then you'll find a pull towards what you're missing. <laughs> so that's the second part, which I would say the pulling part. <laughs> so both exist, but for most of us, it starts with, with a sense of what am I missing? And as Richard Rohr likes to say in his, uh, in his book, I think he quotes Herman Hesse in Falling Upward when he says, our only guide is our homesickness. And we are all homesick. <laughs> we all feel that sense that something is missing. And I think it's important to pursue that. Very good. Very good. So, yeah, what am I missing? What am I homesick for? What do I not have that is occupying me? Yeah, and it Those can be small clues. or big. Yeah, they're yeah. all clues. And, all and clues. stepping into that is a huge gift that you can give yourself. Rasana, thank you so much. You have so much wisdom to share. I'm grateful that you were able to give all of us a little window into your journey and this profound decision that you've made to use your life as a service. Thank you for... Uh, walking with me on that <laughs> and you've been a witness to so many instances in my own life and i feel such a sense of kinship and brotherhood in that journey with you so i really appreciate that i really appreciate it too thank you thank you Vipin. thank you for listening to upbuilding the self upbuild is a leadership development company that offers workshops coaching and other services to help you on the path towards being your best self free from the shackles of the ego. To learn more about our work, visit our website, upbuild.com, and sign up for our newsletter to gain access to podcasts, reflections, and upcoming events. If you enjoyed this episode, please go to iTunes to leave us a review. 
so that others can find and benefit from the podcast. We look forward to being with you again next time.